Hello, I'm Sean Murray, and this is The Conversation, where we take an alternative look at political events and current affairs through an Irish lens. In this show, we hope to pick, probe, investigate, and uncover the stories that you want to hear. We go where mainstream won't go. This week, we look at the legacy of one of Ireland's most gruesome gangs of serial killers, the Shankill Butchers. Led by a sectarian psychopath, Lenny Murphy, the group was notorious for kidnapping, torturing, and murdering random or suspected Catholic civilians. The group was also responsible for the killing of six Protestants over personal disputes, while two others were mistaken for Catholic civilians. This week, I speak to a family member of one of those victims. But before we do, let us get a quick overview on this week's topic. On the 25th of November 1975, the body of a young Catholic man was found in an alleyway just off the Loyalist Schenkel Road in Belfast. Francis Crossan, a 34-year-old father of two, was walking towards the city centre at approximately 12.40am when four members of a sectarian gang pulled up alongside him, beat him with a wheel brace and bundled him into a taxi. As the taxi returned to the safety of the nearby Shankill area, Crossan suffered a ferocious beating. He was subjected to an extreme level of violence, including a beer glass being shoved into his head. The leader of the gang, Lenny Murphy, then ordered the taxi to stop at an entry off Wimbledon Street. Crossan was dragged into an alleyway and Murphy, brandishing a butcher's knife, cut his throat almost through to the spine. Crossan, whose body was found the next morning by an elderly woman, was the first of 30 murders carried out by the gang, later known as the Schenkel Butchers. The barbarity of the butchers shocked a society already prone to many years of violence. As the death toll increased, the levels of fear became palpable. Within nationalist areas, the IRA came under pressure to find the sectarian killers. Detective Chief Inspector Jimmy Nesbitt, head of the CID murder squad in Tennant Street RUC base, and the man charged with tracking down the butchers, was in no doubt that the murders of the first three victims were the work of the same people. But other than that, he had little information. A lead was provided by the woman who found the body of Francis Rice, a few streets away from Murphy's home. The previous night, she had heard voices and what she thought might have been a local black cab style taxi in the entry where the body was later found. This led to a member of the butchers, William Moore's taxi being examined for evidence. However, the butchers had cleaned the vehicle thoroughly and nothing incriminating was found. Late on Tuesday the 10th of May 1977, Gerard McCloverty, a young nationalist, was walking down the Cliftonville Road. Posing as policemen, two members of the butchers approached him and forced him into a car where two more of their accomplices were seated. The gang who had spent the day drinking drove McCloverty to a disused doctor's surgery where he was beaten with sticks. He was then stabbed and had his wrists slashed a number of times by William Moore and Sam McAllister. Uncharacteristically, he had been left for dead by the gang but survived until early morning, when a woman heard his cries for help and called the police. In compliance with previous orders, news of the assault was given to Inspector Nesbitt. The detective then had the recovered McCloverty disguised and driven by police around the Shankill area to see if he could spot the men who had abducted and tortured him. Within a short time, he identified McAllister and Benjamin Edwards. This led to the eventual arrest of most of the gang, who were also members of the UVF. However, the leader, Lenny Murphy, escaped the net as he had already been jailed for a separate weapons charge. The rest of the butchers came to trial during 1978 and early 1979. On the 20th of February 1979, 11 men were convicted of a total of 19 murders and the 42 life sentences handed out were the most ever in a single trial in British criminal history. Lenny Murphy was released in July 1982, where he went on to murder four more people. 
On the 16th of November that year, the provisional IRA caught up with the sectarian killer as he parked his car near his girlfriend's home. He died in a hail of bullets fired by two gunmen. Before I introduce today's guest, I would like to make a request to all our audience members. The recent legacy legislation enacted by the British government has once again revealed the malign nature of Britain's policy towards victims and survivors of the conflict. Within this context, we hope to dedicate the remainder of the series to those voices that have been ignored or marginalised by those that have no interest in genuine attempts at conflict resolution here in Ireland. If you or your family member would like to have your voice heard, please contact us at the link shown below. With that, I would like to introduce my next guest. Cleanna Morrissey's grandfather, Joseph, was a victim of a gruesome attack by the Shankill Butchers. But her story doesn't end there. Her father, Paul, suffering the trauma of her grandfather's death, died at a young age himself. Cleanna is a testament and example of the need to address the transgenerational trauma that affects a large part of our society today. Cleanna, welcome to the show. Hiya. Yeah. Cleanna, firstly, could you tell me, just to begin with, the story of your grandfather? Um, my granda Joe was abducted in Belfast City Centre in 1977, dragged into a car, um, head over the head with a hatchet and took to a house where he was tortured until death. And what age were you aware of, of this incident happened? Of course it was before you were born. I would have became aware around about, probably heard bits and bobs about it, like just my mum and dad probably talking about it or family members when I was about 10, 11. So the an incident which would have changed all of your family members' lives yeah. was something that affected you as soon as you can remember. Yeah. And like all traumatic events, Cleanna, this had a knock-on effect uh, with your, your father. Yeah. Do you want to talk a bit he about that? He identified the body when he was 17. He wasn't supposed to, but he pushed his way in. Um, and after that then, he wasn't the same because of the horrific injuries that he had seen. Um, his head was caved in, his face was so mutilated it was unrecognisable. had numerous lacerations to the face, the neck, the body, um, a V-shaped laceration on his neck, ear to ear. Um, and just the most horrific thing that he would have had to ever witness in his life. This would have became evident to you, I mean, the effects that this had on your father yeah. at, at such a young age. I remember when I was about eight or nine, he had come out of hospital and he had his, his neck was, you know, bandaged up and stuff. And I remember hearing that he had cut his jugular vein out, he had cut his own throat. Um, and then he, he was in Mental Health Institute for a while. He was in a couple of times in the 90s, the late 90s in and out um, and that's whenever I really started to know that he was in a bad way. And you're also saying that he had appeared on the Kelly show speaking about what had happened to his father, is that right? Yeah, he went on the Kelly show to speak about a second book that was coming out. There was a first book released and this was another two guys that wanted to write a new one. Um, can't remember in full detail what the conversation was in full but I know that that's what the topic was. It was on the book and my dad's view on what they were going to be putting into the book. And just on that, Cleanna, the, uh, the first book by Martin Dillon, mm -hmm. what age were you when you, you, you had read that yourself? I seen it in the house, but probably wouldn't have looked into reading it till I was 20s, in my 20s. And even then I didn't read it all, but I knew my dad had it in the house and he had read it. And obviously it was then that you'd become aware of the gruesomeness of what had happened. Yeah, I, I've read the same articles over and over again, many times, just to, I, I don't know, because it just doesn't comprehend what, what these people did. Tell me how, as a grandchild, because you, you were directly affected, obviously, by your father being affected by mm -hmm. but as a grandchild, what is it like to, to, to have to live with? It, it's horrible because it basically broke my father and ruined him as a person, I believe, which in turn then spilled out onto me, my sister, my mother, our family life, our unit. 
and made everything very chaotic and very unstable, which then led to, you know, us having our own personal issues and mental health issues. There was a, an interview that your father had done, I just want to show a clip mm -hmm. here just for the audience's sake, that he had, he had given to Peter Taylor mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and one of the, I think it was the Loyalist documentary, yeah. is that correct, that Peter Taylor had done? We'll just take a quick look at that. Okay. For months, whilst the gang stalked the streets, Catholics were terrified to venture out. When the butchers were finally caught, they were convicted of 19 murders and sentenced to 2,000 years. But the families of their victims are still imprisoned by the memory. In my opinion, when his heart stopped beating and his pulse stopped, he was no longer a victim. It was then that me and my family became the victims and are still the victims some 23 years later. But whilst the law took its course and brought the Shankill butchers to justice, others believed that was not enough. Two of the leaders of the gang were shot dead. One, it is thought, by the IRA, the other by a relative of one of their victims. You surprised the butchers weren't stopped? No. Why not? Because of the then protein leadership. They just let it go ahead? I don't think they had the bottle to stop them. The bottle? The guts? I, at one stage, <coughs> actually tried to commit suicide, where I uh, cut my own throat, and uh, subsequently ended up on a life support machine, and, and uh, from there into a, a mental institution. Why did you try and cut your own throat? I. I'm not a psychologist, so I can't, uh, I have my own opinion, and I think that it was uh, definitely linked to my father. I think in some way, I, subconsciously, I, I might have wanted to know how it really felt. So your father saying there about the fact that he had committed them injuries on himself, I mean, we had spoke earlier and you had said that was something that was recurring. And it was obviously to do with what your fa your grandfather had been through. Yeah, he was traumatized from what he had seen and what he had read on the post mortem, the injuries. Obviously, reliving it over and over in his head. Like I can only imagine if it was one of my parents. Like, how could you ever get that image out of your head? So then it was just kind of me now thinking back. It just felt like a constant, like. Every couple of weeks there was something. He had numerous like breakdowns. Um, he was very angry, very, very angry. Um, and I can imagine why. But as I say, that spilled out into our home life and affected everybody. You know, we were, we were afraid of him. We, you know, because he was so unstable, you didn't really know what you were going to get from one day to the next. Um, I don't doubt that he loved us, um, but I just feel like he was damaged beyond repair. He couldn't help himself and I don't think he could have been helped by anyone else either. Um, and it's unfortunate because it, it took his chance away from being the person, the father that he could have been, that he wanted to be. And you just think that it was the, he, he completely after what happened his father went into self-destruct mode and it, it affected everyone else around him, obviously. Yeah. 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 Even watching the Peter Taylor interview, like, I can see in his eyes that there's just a, like an emptiness there, nearly like a, a blankness, but also a sadness as well. And have you and your family got support yourselves from your father's um, death? We did get some support. Um, 
you know, while my dad was going through certain things and um, seeked out our own support as well through different, different means. And one thing, because I've seen this with other cases, particularly when there's cases where a number of them, people have been killed by the same gang. I mean, I've seen it actually when I uh, made the film on Quiet Graves. There's something in the fact that there are a lot of families who have suffered the same under one yep. group of killers or whatever, mm -hmm. and you're kind of lost in that. Absolutely. Is there any, you know, the, the, the identity or the uniqueness about, because it was a unique and horrific murder, what happened to your grandfather, yeah. but it's kind of lost in all that. Yeah. Do you have any of the families, is there any kind of coordination goes on between the families of the victims? or mm, Not that I've came across, no. Um, I've obviously read articles online and seen, you know, documentaries that were done with other family members of the victims, um, but I've never, you know, met any of them or had any kind of connection with them. I think that's something that maybe help your own family or help other families you yeah know yeah because there was a lot of people impacted by what they done so it's evident that your father went through so much which in turn your family went through so much mm -hmm. in yourself during your childhood and it wasn't easy to, 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 to live with or deal with but you kind of broke that cycle didn't you Clina? yeah um, I had my own issues my own mental health struggles from my own trauma from what I lived with through my father. We all did, me, my mom and my sister. Um, I could have went down a completely different path. I did have bad experiences, was in bad relationships um, till I decided to help myself and do my own self-work and my own self-healing and be more aware of myself and how I wanted my life to be. And I always said that I would never want my kids to live through what I lived through and have a stable home. And what age are your children? 16 and 19. Two boys, I think mm -hmm. you were telling me. Two boys, yeah. I'm sure they're very, very proud of you. Yeah, and I'm very proud of them. And just on that, the, the, to break that cycle, it's very, very difficult mm -hmm. with the areas we come from. I understand you're from a new lodge in West Belfast. It's an exception to break that cycle. Yeah. Let me tell you, because I've seen so many families destroyed by the trauma of what have happened to their loved ones during the, during the conflict. So. Yeah. I'm very proud of my family, my mum and my sister and her wee family unit and the unit my mum has now as well and how they've came through it as well. Like all of us together as a unit now couldn't be any better. Well, Cleana, I want to thank you for coming in today. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And uh, I just, you know, I think your story is just an amazing and it's great to get that kind of side of things, you know, sometimes the, these stories are lost in, in, in the melee of, of some of those, uh, some of those bigger yeah. stories, you know, so, and particularly someone of, of your generation. It's not, it's not something we hear of too often. Yeah. So thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thanks very much. And that does it for another week. We'd love for you to join the conversation by sharing the link to today's programme to help us grow our audience across all our social media platforms. I'd once again like to thank our special guest, Cleana Morrissey, in the meantime, the conversation will be back next week with more investigations and analysis. I'm Sean Murray. Bye for now.